Press Conference USA, a discussion program in which well-known correspondents question a leading personality in the news. Our guest is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. To introduce our guest and the panel of correspondents, here is Robert Lodge, the moderator of Press Conference USA. Welcome to Press Conference USA. Our guest, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, became spokesman and leader of Negroes in the southern United States at the unusually early age of 27. It was during a bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, which resulted in integrated buses, Negroes and whites riding side by side. Later, as head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he turned his attention to desegregation of restaurants and other public facilities. And he has played a leading role in getting Negroes registered to vote, an important step in achieving equal rights. Now at the age of 34, Dr. King, a Baptist minister, married and the father of four children, has become a symbol of the struggle to end racial segregation here in the United States. To interview him, we have a panel of distinguished correspondents, an African, an Asian, and a Southern newspaper man who wrote the book, The Case for the South. Gentlemen, would you identify yourselves? This is George Eninfor, the United Nations correspondent for the Ghana News Agency. This is William Workman of Columbia, South Carolina, associate editor of the state newspaper. This is T.V. Parish Ram, Washington correspondent for the Indian Express group of newspapers. Now we will begin our questioning with Mr. Parasaram. Dr. King, this year, 1963, is, I suppose, going to be a decisive year in the struggle of the Negro race for equality in this country. I wonder whether you could tell us what has been achieved so far this year and what your immediate goals are going to be. So far this year, we have seen many cities in the southern part of the United States desegregate public facilities as a result of the mass de demonstrations that have taken place, the various sit-in movements and so forth. And uh, I think this will continue. It seems to me that uh, probably now more than ever before, we stand uh, on the threshold of a very significant breakthrough in civil rights in the United States. And I think we have a good chance to get strong, meaningful civil rights legislation. And if this uh, legislation is enacted and implemented, we will go a long, long way toward uh, making the American dream a reality. I do not think uh, civil rights legislation will solve all of the problems that we now face, and it will certainly not bring about integration in all of its dimensions, but I do think it will solve many problems, and I think it will bring about many of the goals which we seek in this struggle. Mr. Workman. Dr. King, will you spell out your conception of civil rights, which to me means those rights which are prescribed by statute or by constitution and not those which go to the social conduct or to the commerce of the ordinary marketplace? Well, I would think of civil rights as those basic rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution on the basis of the First and the Fourteenth Amendments. Uh, I think there is a distinction between social privilege on the one hand and civil rights on the other. It is one thing to say who will sit in my living room as a friend and as a guest is another thing to say uh, who will sit beside me on the bus or in a public place. I think at that point uh, a violation is a violation of civil rights. I think in the first instance I have the choice to determine who will be a guest in my house. And I think all public facilities uh, should be open to all citizen, citizens without uh, regards to race, nationality, or religion. Uh, 
Now, by public facilities, I take it you include privately owned facilities and make those public. Yes, I would include uh, privately owned facilities that are publicly sustained and dependent on the very public for their survival. Uh, I'm not speaking of one's home again, but I am speaking of any business that is in the public market and that is dependent on the public for its survival and also that is licensed by the state for its very operation and its very existence. You then would deny to the proprietor the right to select that portion of the public to whom he wants to cater? Yes, if it's on the basis of race. I think he ought to have the right to keep drunk people out. I think he ought to have the right to keep people who are not uh, in the proper disposition as far as their manners are concerned. But I do not think any proprietor should have the right to deny a person uh, access to the facilities of his particular business because of race. I think uh, a businessman should have rights, but he must also see that business is not only a right, it is a privilege and responsibility. And if by such admission he were to lose his white patronage and go out of business, that would be acceptable in your view? Well, there again, I don't think our nation can ever rise to its full maturity until businesses come to see that no individual should be denied service because of race. I do not think this will lead to a mass uh, exodus on the part of uh, white customers. This has been demonstrated over and over again in, in the struggle for civil rights. Many cities, in fact, more than 275 cities in the South have integrated their lunch counters and other uh, facilities since 1960. And on the whole, these businesses have uh, increased in terms of their income rather than decreased. And I think uh, this will continue to be true. Uh, but I do not think that one should uh, deny service to members of another race because there are some recalcitrant individuals who threaten to withdraw their services if the facilities are integrated. Mr. Ennenfall. Dr. King, um, President Kennedy's proposed civil rights um, bill now before the Congress has been described in certain quarters as far-reaching. On the other hand, uh, other uh, people choose to describe it as um, uh, very uh, inhuman and uh, sadistic, especially in the words of uh, Georgia's uh, Senator Russell a few days ago. Uh, could you care to comment on the President's uh, proposed uh, legislation before Congress? I would say that this is a very strong, far-reaching bill. Uh, certainly it is the strongest bill that has ever been presented by any president of our nation. This does not mean that it has everything in it that I would like to see. Uh, for, in for instance, I, I had hoped that a federal fair employment practice bill would have been submitted with the president's bill and uh, some other things such as giving the attorney general the right to initiate suits in any area where there is a denial of civil rights wherein this bill only calls for the attorney general having the right to initiate suits uh, in the area of school desegregation but with these uh, points missing I think by and large it is a strong and forthright bill now, I would have to disagree with the Honorable Senator of the state of Georgia, which happens to be my home state, when he says that this is a, an inhuman bill or a sinister bill. Uh, I think, on the contrary, it is in line with the deepest uh, principles of our American democracy. And I think uh, it really carries with it all of the deep insights of the democratic uh, ideal as well as the American dream. Uh, deeply, uh, rather, uh, one of the basic things 
in our country is the Declaration of Independence, which speaks of the fact that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, I don't think these things can be meaningful and real until all of the citizens of our country are guaranteed their basic civil and constitutional rights. And I think this bill is in line with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and I think it will carry our whole nation back to those great insights and those great principles if it is enacted and implemented. Dr. King, Senator Russell has said, and others have said, that the patterns of the past cannot be changed overnight, that whites cannot change their attitudes, for instance, so fast as Negroes would like them to change them. How do you answer that statement? I think uh, we are dealing with uh, two matters here. On the one hand, we are dealing with the problem of grappling with behavior and controlling behavior. On the other hand, we are dealing with changing attitudes. Now, I quite agree that uh, attitudes are not often changed overnight. And in this sense, it may be true that you cannot legislate morals. But while it is true that uh, morality cannot be legislated, uh, we, must, uh, we must see the other side, and that is that behavior can be regulated. Uh, the law may not change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. And uh, I think it is uh, an immoral uh, posture uh, to hold the position that individuals, whether they be Negroes or members of other minority groups, should have their basic constitutional and God-given rights held up until some misguided individuals uh, are able to change their attitudes. I think by changing the system itself, we are often able to make it easier for individuals to change their attitudes. And uh, I think by bringing desegregation into being, it will cause many people who are slow to change their attitudes move to the point uh, of changing their attitudes easier than they would otherwise. Well, Negroes constitute uh, about one-tenth of the United States population. Do you think that they can achieve equal rights without the goodwill or agreement of the white majority, or in other words, don't you see your task primarily that of one of persuasion? Yes, I think uh, this is very basic, but I wouldn't say it's only persuasion. I see it as both persuasion and uh, legislation and all that goes along with that, both persuasion and moral coercion. Uh, I think it's quite true that if we're to have an integrated society, it must come by a change of the heart and through persuasion. On the other hand, I think you can legislate desegregation. Uh, I think that the habits, if not the hearts of men, have been and are being changed every day by judicial decrees, executive orders from the president, and by legislative acts so that you cannot uh, legislate integration, but you can certainly legislate desegregation. And there is a difference between the two. Mr. Enenful. Dr. King, in your reply to the letter of uh, eight Alabama clergymen, I think of about uh, the April 16th or so, um, you, I think, uh, criticized the attitude of the white moderates, as you put it, and also uh, the church. And uh, you said that if the church of today did not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, uh, it would lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of its villains, and uh, be dismissed as irrelevant and a social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Um, could you expand on this in the light of the role played by the church or expected of the church as a moral and a persuasive authority in the Negro movement towards equality? I think 
I would have to honestly admit that in the past, the church has not stood up in this area as it should stand up. Uh, at this point, I think the church has failed Christ uh, miserably. Uh, the church has so often been the tail light instead of the headlight, and uh, we must face the tragic fact that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning when thousands of Christians all over the United States stand to sing in Christ there is no east or west, uh, we stand in the most segregated hour of America. Uh, I think uh, this is appalling, and yet we must face it as uh, a fact of, of our nation. On the other hand, I think I must say that some very encouraging the things have developed within the last few weeks. I mean encouraging developments within the church. Uh, church groups are now taking the kind of forthright stand uh, that I have longed to see as, as a minister of the gospel. Uh, the Protestant, uh, rather the National Council of Churches, came out just uh, three weeks ago uh, with a very strong statement calling not only for an end to segregation as a pronouncement, but calling for its uh, various denominations and ministers to participate in demonstrations and direct action programs to end segregation. Uh, the same thing has developed uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, and very strong pronouncements have come from the various rabbinical councils. Many of the rabbis have come out so that uh, I see a new development in the church, which is uh, a very significant development, and to my mind, a new beacon light of hope. And I think the church now is moving on in the way that it should move, and it is making its witness clear. Mr. Parasaram. Dr. King. To what, extent, to what extent have you patterned your movement on the struggle waged by Mr. Gandhi in India? And to what extent is the uh, struggle of the American Negro part of the worldwide movement for freedom of the Afro-Asian people? Because after all, you're also basically an African people settled down in the United States. To answer the last part of the question first, uh, I would say that our movement here in the United States is in a real sense a part of a worldwide struggle to break down the barriers of injustice and oppression. It is not an isolated or detached struggle, but it is a part of this worldwide struggle for freedom and human dignity. Now, on the first part of the question, I would say that our movement has been patterned after the Gandhian movement in India a great deal. Uh, I have been influenced by uh, Mahatma Gandhi a great deal, and I think this is true of many, many people uh, in the movement in the United States. Uh, some years ago, when I first studied the Gandhian uh, philosophy and the method of nonviolent resistance, I came to the conclusion that it was the most potent uh, weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and human dignity. And I would say that this overall direct action movement with its sit-ins and its stand-ins, its wait-ins, its kneel-ins, its mass marches and pilgrimages and all of the other elements that enter the struggle have been patterned a great deal uh, after Gandhi. Now, there are certainly some uh, sociological differences in that in the United States we are a numerical minority uh, facing the opposition of uh, many individuals who form a numerical majority, when in India it was uh, the other way around. The other thing is that we are struggling for integration, when in India there was a struggle for independence, and there is a difference. In one instance, you're seeking to gain freedom from a foreign invader. In the other instance, you're seeking to come to a new adjustment and the kind of integrated brotherly living uh, with the very people who in the same situation are oppressing you. 
to follow that up, would you say that when you succeed in your struggle, this will not be an anti-white movement, but this is really to fulfill the American dream of the purpose of Declaration of Independence. In other words, the United States will be a better place to live in, not only for the Negro, but also for the white people. Very definitely. I conceive of this struggle not as a struggle to free 20 million Negroes in the United States, but a struggle to free 180 million citizens of this country. And I don't think anybody in this country can be truly free until the Negro is free. And I certainly don't think the white man is free as long as you have segregation and discrimination because uh, the festering sore of segregation debilitates a white man as well as a Negro. And this is why I say that our aim in this struggle is not to defeat or to humiliate the white man, but to win his friendship and understanding. And the end is reconciliation and the creation of the beloved community. We are not seeking to annihilate the opponent, but to convert him. And this is why we follow nonviolence. Uh, I think uh, the end of violence is to get rid of, uh, to annihilate the opponent. But in the nonviolent movement, the end is to convert the opponent and to bring about a society where all men will live together as brothers and every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Mr. Workman. Do I understand you, Doctor, to mean that you would have then brotherhood by federal force to those people who are not willing to engage in what you would consider to be brotherhood? No, I, I don't mean you would have brotherhood by federal force. I don't think you can really have uh, true brotherhood by federal force. I do think, though, that you can break down the legal and the external and the man-made barriers that make brotherhood impossible by federal force. In other words, I don't think you can have brotherhood as long as there is a system of racial segregation. Now, I do feel that this system can be broken down by federal force. Now, when you move to the realm of true brotherhood, a true integration, which is genuine intergroup, interpersonal living, mutual acceptance, then we move into another realm altogether. And I don't think this can be done by federal force, but I think that these barriers can be broken down and it can bring us nearer to the goal. If the president's program were incorporated or such portions of it that would lend themselves to this, how would you feel about submitting this to a vote of the people of the United States who have never really had an opportunity to express themselves in this area? Well, this would certainly be all right with me because I think the vast majority of people in the United States would vote favorably for such a bill. I think the tragedy is that uh, we have a Congress uh, with a Senate that has a minority of misguided senators who will use the filibuster to keep the majority of people from even voting. They won't let the majority of senators vote. And certainly they wouldn't want the majority of people to vote because they know they do not represent the majority of the American people. In fact, they represent in their own states a very small minority. Senator Eastland of Mississippi represents a very uh, uh, small minority of the number of people who live in that state. And I think this is true all across the South. Well, is not this part of the American system? And then you would, in effect, change the system so that there would be dictation from executive office rather than legislation under our present system of representation? Well, this is a system, but it is not democratically applied in so many southern states. Uh, let us take the state of Mississippi as an example. Uh, you have about 20,000 Negroes registered to vote in the state of Mississippi. Uh, now, many of these people are not registered because all types of conniving methods are still being used to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. And in fact, some are even killed for seeking to lead voter registration drives so that the democratic process is not operative in situations like Mississippi and Alabama and so many of the other states, southern states, 
where there is this determined effort to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. Well, let me say this, that if the right to vote, which is a basic civil right, is prescribed both by the Constitution and by statute, I think there can be no uh, one to impede that. But I'm confused over what you term to be basic constitutional rights which would give the federal government authority to direct one's private business. Under what section of the Constitution would you say that could be done? Well, I think it could be done under several sections, but I would like to see it under the 14th Amendment, which says that no state uh, has a right uh, to deny an individual equal protection of the law. And every state has a responsibility, it has the authority to give these businesses licenses to operate. And the fact that this is done by the state means that these businesses at that moment forfeit the right to deal with uh, individuals uh, any way they please. They must be under the scrutiny and under the direction of federal authority on the basis of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Well, an extension of that then would mean that all of us who are licensed to drive automobiles would come within state scrutiny for whatever purpose they wish to do. The state's hand extends everywhere, you see. Oh, yes, it, it, it extends everywhere where basic human constitutional rights are involved. And I am absolutely convinced that there's something wrong with a nation that would put property rights over human rights. And I think states should have rights, but no state should have the right to do wrong. And this is why we have a 14th Amendment, to regulate uh, these wrongs that are often committed in the name of states' rights. Mr. Ennenfall. Dr. Keen, um, the impressions that one seemed to have um, from the initial hearings on the pr uh, president's proposed civil rights uh, measure seem to be that uh, there will be an uphill fight uh, to get the bill through. Um, should either there be a filibuster, or for that matter, if when it comes to the vote, uh, the bill is defeated, what sort of um, action um, do you uh, propose I mean, to fight uh, for the attainment of um, equality? And for that matter, do you anticipate um, working much more closely with the other separate Negro movements? I think uh, there will be, I'm sure, a filibuster, and we will definitely protest this. We will lobby in Washington seeking to get congressmen, uh, senators to stand up in a very firm, forthright manner with a determination to see this bill through. We plan to have a march on Washington on the 28th of August, at which time we will take a stand, letting the nation and the world know that we are determined to see civil rights legislation. Uh, beyond this, we will have to wait it out and see what happens. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. King, but our time has expired. Thank you for being with us on Press Conference USA. This has been Press Conference USA. Our guest has been the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. On the panel were George Enninful, United Nations correspondent for the All-African News Agency of Accra, Ghana, T.V. Parathuram, Washington correspondent for the Indian Express newspapers, and William Workman, associate editor of The State and the Columbia Record in Columbia, South Carolina. The moderator was Robert Lodge.